make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> Our economics department is characterized by a, a strong belief in in the benefit of free markets. So if you allow business people or people in, in who are employers under obviously certain you know environmental and other regulations to have the most freedom possible to create wealth and to employ people and to have less regulation and lower taxes, they will create an environment where there's most opportunity for people to move up. And that's our view. I happen to think we do have some issues right now with inflation. We have some issues with um, people who have a desire to work but don't necessarily have the skills that the workplace needs right now. And we need to work on those. But all in all, and, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say who's responsible for it. All in all, the American economy is remarkably strong. Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing well, Will. Thanks. Uh, and this week, we are delighted to have Robert Doerr with us this week. He is an American academic businessman and former public administrator and serves as the 12th president of the American Enterprise Institute. Um, his research focuses on a number of different things to include federal and state anti-poverty policies and safety net programs, which we will get into much later in the conversation. So welcome to uh, welcome to Faithful Politics. Thanks for having me. I do have to say, I've, I've never been a businessman. Well, oh. maybe a long, long time ago, I was a banker, <laughs> but I've been mostly a, a public po- public sector employee for Governor Pataki and then Mayor Bloomberg, and now at AEI as a scholar and a not-for-profit. But uh, boy, I'd love to be a businessman someday. My wife, my wife has a yes, but not me. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, I, I I just have to say, AEI is one of those organizations that as a liberal, um, I have a lot of respect for. Um, and I'm sure I'm, I'm probably not alone in saying that. I mean, I, I've been, I've been sort of following AI in the path, um, since, um, Arthur Brooks, um, had the helm and he's written a, a lot of really great books that I've read. <laughs> so, um, I really appreciate, you know, everything that you guys are doing over Absolutely. there, but, but I, but I'm curious, like, how does one become the president of AEI? Like, did you have to apply on Indeed or Munster or something like that? Well, it was kind of an interesting story. You know, Arthur was my predecessor as president, and um, but I came here as a scholar nine years ago uh, and, and recruited by Arthur because I had finished up working as the social services commissioner in New York City for Mike Bloomberg, and I was a, a, a commissioner in social services that felt the best path out of poverty was employment. And that meant having policies that really pushed people into employment when they sought forms of government assistance. And that was successful. Um, And Arthur would talk about the dignity of work and the importance of work. And he had a sense of the spiritual value of conservative principles leading to people moving up. But he didn't really know the details of the programs. If you asked him what SNAP was or what the EITC was, he, he might know or he might not know. And the people here at AI felt we needed someone who had really knew the programs, the safety net programs in the United States. And so they recruited me to come here to be the poverty studies director, which I did for a while and loved very much and wrote, wrote pieces and testified and convened working groups. And, and then when Arthur left, I got worried that the, that the um, AI would lose its, its strength and, and maybe miss a beat at a particularly crucial time for our country. And so I had been a manager, and this job is a managing job, and I raised my hand, and the board knew me and liked me, and they chose me. So it's it's a good stretch for me because I'd always been very focused on safety net programs in the United States, and as president of AI, I have to have a much broader perspective. We have a big foreign policy and defense policy unit. We do a lot on economics. We do a lot on social, culture, and constitutional studies. Um, and I've loved it, um, but it's broader than just focusing on the safety net programs of the United States. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I have heard of a lot of think tanks in Washington, D.C. I've always wanted to be a part of a think tank. And maybe we can talk about how do we start a think tank? <laughs> like me and Will, like, do we just sit around thinking? And then like, in it anyway, I'm, I'm being weird. Well, you, um, the key to a think tank is to produce research and produce yeah, there academic you go. work that is published and publishable and op-eds and, and, and brings new new ways of thinking about old, old challenges. Um, yeah, I got, love and there's a lot of them in this town. AI happens to be one of the <laughs> oldest and best, but uh, if you want to start one, there, there, there's one to be started. There's always one to be started. So how do you differentiate yourself from say, from say like heritage foundation or Brookings Institute or any of those things? How, what makes AEI unique? among these think tanks well for one we we hire scholars who are at the at, who have achieved great credibility in their fields uh, we don't hire mm-hmm. analysts and then make them make them important players we hire people that are already important players and then we give them complete freedom to write and say what they think they've earned that ability and that gives them greater credibility they are not speaking for the house they're not speaking for me they're not speaking for AI institutionally. They're speaking for themselves. Then we give them the resources, the research assistance, the access to data, the government relations contacts, the communications assistance. Um, and But what distinguishes us is that we give complete independence to our scholars. That's different, for instance, than Heritage, for sure, where they very much have to follow the house uh, mood. Um, and then we also... Um, uh, are right of center. So we are quite clearly, um, we believe in free markets, free people, limited government. Mm. We believe in treating individuals as individuals, not as representatives of, of larger groups. Um, and we take a, we have a point of view and that distinguishes us. Brookings likes to think of themselves as completely without a point of view. That's not really true. Their scholars tend to tilt left. We tend Mm. to right toward freedom. And, um, and so I think that's what, and then it's just quality. It's, it's how, how much work do you put out? We put out probably 15 things a day by any one of our, you know, of, if you took it all that comes wow. out in wow. research, op-eds, television appearances, other forms of communication in the public policy dialogue. Um, so we're large. Um, we are, we are influential. We, we track how our ideas are translated into legislation or public policy. And then we like to see how those ideas that are translated into public policy lead to better outcomes for Americans. Um, so those are some ways in which we distinguish ourselves. That, that's interesting. I, I, what do you think um, is probably one of the biggest accomplishments of, you know, a lot of the work and, and um, stuff that you guys are putting out? Well, there's a lot of accomplishments over many years. The most recent one where that I was personally involved in was, in the original Build Back Better legislation, uh, President Biden wanted very much to include um, a new child tax credit that would go to all families with children, regardless of whether they worked at all, and would come every month from the IRS. And it was in place during the COVID crisis, and he wanted to make that permanent. Um, our scholars were very troubled by that because for two reasons. One, there was a big disincentive to work. It led, led to let people participating less in the labor force. And we think that's ultimately bad for people's efforts to get out of poverty. And then second, it sort of boxed out or eliminated the role of the local social services provider because the checks were coming from Washington without any case management or any involvement in these families' lives. The Democrats felt strongly about this. It was their highest priority. Senator President Biden said it was his highest priorities. We wrote a lot about our concerns about it. We talked to people in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, and ultimately we persuaded enough members of Congress to say they couldn't support that extension and expansion of the child tax credit, so that Biden had to re- rewrite the proposal and scale it way back and eliminate that, what I, we thought would have been an unhelpful cash benefit to Americans. That was We view that as an accomplishment. Um, another is the war in Ukraine. Um, when the Russians invaded Ukraine, What they wanted was that the world wouldn't really know what was going on, and they just assumed that this great power would swallow up this smaller country to their south. Uh, But we have uh, something called Critical Threats Projects that monitors through open source technology and and people who have language skills the, the 
activities in parts of the world where hot spots occur. And we were immediately putting out information, hey, wait a minute, Ukraine is winning. The Russians are not just walking over the Ukraine. And, and that fortified the strength and the resolve of the people in Ukraine, the people in Western Europe, and the United States. And as a result, partly as a result of that information, we, um, we've helped to rally the world in defense of the of the Ukrainian people against this um, invasion by their neighbor. That's amazing. Those are big accomplishments. Yeah, no, 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 no kidding. And, and uh, I want, I definitely want to get back to to Ukraine, um, but I I I want to, you know, kind of continue the conversation about um, the child tax credit because you know that that definitely kind of gets into a lot of these social welfare programs that I know that um, you're passionate about. And, um, you know, and I, I definitely want to ask you more questions about that. But but before I do, I, I'm, I'm curious of, like, with your work um, kind of in that, that arena, um, I feel, so I'm a Democrat, um, Josh is a conservative, and, um, you know, at least from my side, like, we hear a lot of vilification um, that comes along with some of these social welfare programs. You know, there's this, there's this belief that people that, you know, are on social security or are on, you know, um, EBT cards or what have you like, like that they are just lazy and they don't want to work. Um, I, I would guess probably by your, you know, experience and um, background in this, you would probably say that might be true, but for a small percentage of the population like um but but well, so, so I, look, I look at true when people do work the <laughs> what i normally say is we should require work but we also should reward work and in the programs for instance i ran the food stamp program in new york city i ran the medicaid program in new york city they work best when they work in combination with employment for the recipient so they mm -hmm. they they make wages go further or they make work pay as president clinton used to say the earned income tax credit. Again, it's a supplement to wages. But if you're not working at all, and many Americans who receive some of these benefits aren't working at all, then they're not a, out of poverty and there's not enough there to help them. And they're not getting the benefit of the dignity of work. Um, so my view is it requires both support from government. And when it does, uh, in combination with work, it is a very, very effective way to help families move out of poverty, strengthen their social well-being, uh, improve outcomes for their children in school, reduce the extensions which they have in interaction with criminal justice system. Um, and it's also bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats have supported work supports over many years. The food stamp program, when it works as a work supplement, everybody likes. The, the EITC is a longstanding bipartisan program. To health insurance for working low-income people is also longstanding bipartisan support. So the only question is when someone says, I want to give this benefit, and I don't care whether people work. They should get it anyway, and we shouldn't worry about whether they're working. That's when we will say, not to denigrate the recipient, but frankly to denigrate the government for giving help to someone in a way that isn't really helping them. And so whenever I would get into this debate, I'd always say, the work requirement I'm talking about, most importantly, is on the social services provider to require them to help the person get a job. And not to say anything, you know, I don't, I'm sorry to say this, but a lot of Democrats don't want to do that anymore. They don't want social services providers asking people, why aren't you working and how can I help you get a job? They just want to send them a check. And I, having worked in programs in very high poverty communities, feel that is very destructive. Yeah, it's almost like, um, and I, I, I re regret to say this. So if you're a veteran listening to this, don't, don't, um, don't cancel me. But like, so I'm a veteran and um, served in um, over Operation Iraqi Freedom One, came back all kind of beat it up and bruised. Um, and, you know, I collect um, disability from from the VA. Um, but I've got a lot of friends who are also um, veterans that have have made it almost a sport to kind of get to 100%. Um, and and I've long thought, you know, a, a lot of that behavior is because the VA is, is rewarding your brokenness 
not, not like rewarding you getting better, you know, because if you told me, hey, if you took every opportunity to try to, you know, work with counselors and get over your PTSD, like that will incentivize you more than me just saying, yeah, give me my pills, you know, um, and I, I'd imagine a lot of a lot of what you're talking about is is similar. Yes. And I admire that and completely agree with you about that. Um, And I work with the disability programs of the United States as well. Social Security Administration, disability programs, veterans disability programs. And they have insufficient attention to employment. Um, I'm here speaking to you from not far from DuPont Circle. The street homeless population, including the male street homeless population, are often recipients of SSI disability payments. And those come with no expectation of case management or employment. And as a result, they're financing um, a a really difficult circumstance for that individual. And in my opinion, that's that's sad. Yeah, I understand what you're saying there. You know, economics are such a huge thing for all of us, of course. And I know it's one of the top concerns coming into this next election, even according to some of your reports, right, that it's a major concern for inflation. And that doesn't need a report to me to be concerned about that. I'm I'm concerned about inflation every day. Um, and the inequality, income inequality that we hear talked about a lot, um, conservatives and liberals have different perspectives on these. And, you know, of course, even the welfare, like we've been speaking of, what is AEI's perspective? Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, what is AEI's perspective on these topics? Or does AEI have a perspective? Or is it just an accumulation of the scholars' opinions? Yeah, so we don't take official positions, but our economics department is characterized by a a strong belief in, in the benefit of free markets. So if you allow business people or people in, in, who are employers under obviously certain you know environmental and other regulations to have the most freedom possible to create wealth and to employ people and to have less regulation and lower taxes, they will create an environment where there's most opportunity for people to move up. And that's our view. I happen to think we do have some issues right now with inflation. We have some issues with um, people who have a desire to work but don't necessarily have the skills that the workplace needs right now, and we need to work on those. But all in all, and you know, I don't, I'm not going to say who's responsible for it. All in all, the American economy is remarkably strong, and it's remarkably strong because compared to the rest of the world, it's mostly free. It's more free than Europe, hmm. more free than China, it's far more free than Russia, and that's that's working for the Americans. It doesn't promise everybody a rose garden, but it promises them an opportunity to work uh, uh, in a way that would lead them to achieve a, 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 a good middle class existence. And so we got to work on some of these things. But if you ask me, what is AI's perspective? The more we allow employers and, and entrepreneurs and business people to create uh, jobs, the better we will be. In New York City, under Michael Bloomberg, I mean, he never, ever said that 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 he was against the creation of any kind of job because any job is better than no job. And we promoted economic development. We promoted the tourist industry. We promoted the hospitality industry. We promoted manufacturing. And when when that economy is going well, people who fight poverty, like me, have the wind at our back. It's just so much easier when there are jobs available for people uh, to find and get, and then get the training they need to move up. So um, we're not, we're not, uh, if just generally, and I don't, you may have had some other guests that are more negative about America. We're not negative about America at AEI. We feel Me a Republican president. We're not going to tell you that the world is coming to an end or the greatness of America is lost. Um, the economic facts are we are growing faster than Europe. We're growing faster than China. We're going to be the largest economy in the world, the most prosperous. There's a reason why people come from all over the world to the United States, people who are very poor. Do you know why they do that? Because we have the most opportunity and we have the greatest country in the world. And we just want to preserve that. 
That's awesome. Uh, can you talk about um, the the work that you guys do at the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility? So when I came, I was the director of the Poverty Studies Program, and the, the theme was how do we structure American public policy and not-for-profit world and the faith-based world to help people move up out of poverty. We feel that over the long term and looked at properly measured, we have, through the combination of work and benefits, and, and benefits have played a role, and so has work, we have increased the material well-being of, of Americans at the bottom. So the challenge really isn't so much getting people above a minimum bo- a minimum standard of living. We've done that. The challenge is helping them move up, getting the skills and the abilities and the, the, the experience to achieve a complete independence from any kind of government assistance. And so that they're, if you're born at the bottom, you have a, a good chance, more than just a, a one in four chance or one in five chance, but maybe even a, a two in four chance or to move up to the middle or all the way to the top. So we focus on ways to help people move up through education, through skills development, through employment, obviously, um, through better economic uh, environment and communities, um, and, and, through, and by the way, through greater family formation. We happen to think that the number one divide in America between those who do well and those who do, don't do well is not race, uh, it's not where you live, it's not urban-rural, it's not even income. It's are you raised in a household with two active and involved parents there for the long haul? And that usually happens in the United States under merit, in marriage. So we talk a lot about family, too, as being a key way to help people move up. And I should also mention we talk about faith. We talk about the benefits of faith-based organizations in communities, and we talk about the benefits of religion to individuals to have a more uh, uh, flourishing life. And so all of those ingredients go into helping people move up. Man, that is so fascinating. So I've heard the statistic that if you want to stay out of poverty in America, not a statistic, kind of a um, a heuristic rather, that one, you need to graduate high school, two, you need to get married, and three, you need to not have a baby out of wedlock. Yeah, that's is not, that fairly it's, accurate. It's, yeah, that's a statistic. It's a it's a well known statistic, and it was done by my colleagues at Brookings about twelve years ago. We here at AI oh, nice. promote that statistic because when we have it, we see a scholar at Heritage or Brookings or anywhere who does good work, and that's that that changes the conversation. We talk about it, and it is true. If you I love that, if you graduate from high school, get a job, and don't have a child until you're married, you'll be there's a ninety eight percent chance you will not you and your child will not be in poverty. It's pretty good. That is a really good uh, statistic. It's amazing how it, sometimes we feel like we ignore that. But, you know, when we're talking about families, oftentimes, you know, when we're at the dinner table or we're at Thanksgiving, the extended family, they come in, we talk about politics, we talk about religion, things get weird. This whole show is about talking about that because <laughs> we want to help us ruin Thanksgiving dinner. That's yeah. our that's well, our uh, yeah. purpose. Like that's our official mission. So um, my question, though, one really controversial topic is uh, is climate change, and I say controversial because some people think it's not controversial. Some people think oh, it's clear. Everyone just believes this. This is reality. What's interesting though, even according to the, like a report that you guys published, I think it was a 2024 presidential election evolving political coalitions. You said that there's a noticeable difference between Democrats and Republicans concerning the country's main problems. Um, like climate change is something like 66% of Democrats see that as a top concern compared to like 13% of Republicans. And I'm just curious, like about climate change, what, what is, I guess AI, AI doesn't have a position and that, and that's fine, but what's, what kind of work is being done on that issue right now? And even maybe raising awareness and conversation among more conservative people. Cause I have friends and family and other people that I met that that say it's doesn't exist. It's all a lie. And they're people that I care about, trust, and I don't think they're dumb or weird or anything like that. And and yet I, I struggle to 
to understand where they're coming from. So, um, so, yeah, so we have had scholars and do have scholars who write about climate change. And our general view is that there is a warming of the planet and that human activity is contributing to the warming of the planet. And we should recognize that, but we should make sure we measure it correctly and don't exaggerate the trend lines and project them into the future in a way that the data doesn't justify. And we also need to recognize that the planet's always been changing temperature. This is not unusual in the history of the planet. Um, And so that we've always been challenged as humanity to adjust to changes in the planet. The second is that we shouldn't make uh, changes that actually hurt us or hurt the poorest among us worse than, than the problem that we're facing. And there are some climate policies that would be very damaging Mm. to the growth potential, especially of people in the Southern Hemisphere, in the poorer parts of the world, who haven't had the benefit of the economic development that we have. And we just can't do that to to places that need running water or need electricity or need power that where they haven't had it more than they need to be be stopped because we're trying to stop a long-term climate change. So we think there's some aspect of the rhetoric about climate change that comes from people that are think it's a real catastrophe that has the potential to be very harmful to people, especially the most vulnerable people in the world. Um, and then finally, we don't turn our backs on, on, we think there's an element of the climate change argument or the people who support more aggressive action on climate change that just is contradictory. So for instance, if you really cared about climate change, you would support the the production of nuclear power. It's clean, doesn't contribute to climate uh, change, and we should do that. Oddly, people that are worried about climate change won't agree to help us develop more nuclear power. That makes no sense to us. That's like hypocritical. Um, yeah. Similarly, we create a, we have, you should know, every day we're creating more and more power through solar and wind. It's all great, but you know what solar and wind power has to do? It has to get to the customer. Do you know how it gets to the customer? Through power lines. Do you know who prevents the creation of new power lines so we can take this clean energy and get it to the customer? Climate activists and environmental activists that don't let like any kind of development. And we find that just preposterous. And so the business yes. of, of facing up to people who use the language of climate change or excessive radical environmentalism or uh, to stop the, the, the creation of, cli- of power lines that can take clean energy and get it to the customer. To me, to us, that's crazy. So we have a scholar, Jim Coleman, who's a law professor at the University of Minnesota. He's also affiliated with us. He's the foremost expert on that. And he's always writing about if you care about climate, you've got to also care about building the power lines that get clean energy to the to the customer. I guess I would just say one other. The United States oil and gas industry produces oil and gas in the cleanest way in the world. We should promote American energy producers who do it right and do it in a clean way, not run around the world and get other energy oil companies, oil producing countries to produce more of their oil in a dirty way for some weird reason, because we don't allow it here, but we like it over there. That makes no sense to us. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sensitive and I would say sensitive isn't the right word, but I'm, I'm definitely appreciative of your arguments and I'm sympathetic to them is the word I was looking for, uh, to your arguments. Definitely, uh, agree with basically most of everything you said. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the vulnerable people idea, because one of the things I hear all the time in my conversations with parishioners, with congregants, with friends, with people online, liberal, especially in the liberal camp, Mm -hmm. is that um, climate change, we're disproportionately affecting the poor by not handling climate change because uh, climate change is disproportionately affecting the poor and especially the global South. And you had mentioned some policies that are being pushed forward that actually even exacerbate that problem. And they're supposed to be climate change policies. Could you elaborate on some of those? Because it seems like the very thing that they are saying, you're saying, no, well, we're trying to make sure yeah. the poor are not disproportionately I think, I think, affected. First of all, I think there is some truth to the fact, and this is true in a lot of things, 
that if there are if there is a um, consequence for humanity of climate change, it's likely to hurt the poorest among us the worst. When bad things happen, those who are poorest ha- suffer the most. It's just a reality. And so I acknowledge that. What I was trying to say was, however, was that if you limit the production of traditional energy sources in an effort to reduce climate change, you may actually be harming the ability of poorer parts of the world to do the basic kind of development of electricity that is fundamental to a flourishing community that they just haven't had yet. That's number one. And I think that's generally accepted. People know that we don't want to do things to stop the development of energy that prevents our ability to feed the the truly uh, hungry in the world or or allow for uh, people to be um, sure. have the, the energy they need to live a normal life or a, a 20th century life. So that's all I was saying. But I do acknowledge that, that, that when climate change hits, there may be parts of the world that um, are very poor and are going to suffer consequence. And we should be concerned about that. I don't deny that. We should keep an eye out on that. The only last thing I'll just say is that the change in, in, in the production of, of, um, of, of energy that that causes climate change has been quite remarkable in the in the west in the United States and in the the developed world um, but if we really want to make progress in reducing the growth in the 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 rise in temperatures in the planet we're going to have to get some help from China mm. and Africa and South America yeah, for in sure the way in which they generate energy but we don't want to do it in a way that hurts their people more than the benefit of reducing the rate of increase in 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 the temperature of the world makes sense yeah you know um it, even though i'm a liberal i I'm, I'm i'm very pro nuclear um i i had a i had a chance to to visit you know one of the largest uranium depots in the country um and speak with some of the folks that that work at at that facility and um you know that the, the individual I was talking to was saying, yeah, I don't understand why, you know, more people in your camp, you know, don't, don't support nuclear. I'm like, I don't know either. Uh, Cause I was like, like we have so many regulations in this country <laughs> that, yeah. that it, yeah. it would, it would almost have to take like an act of sabotage uh, to, you know, um, have the same thing happen here as it happens, you know, overseas. And even still like the, the occurrence is fairly low. I mean, you know, catastrophic, but still like on a, on a mm-hmm. broader scale, fairly yeah. low, but um, so, so yeah, you're, 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 a, you're in good company, at least with this, with this particular liberal um, about that issue. <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I want to talk about you, Ukraine. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, now it's, I don't know, a year, year and a half. I can't remember exactly mm-hmm. how long the, the conflict's been going on, but um, talk to me about the conflict i mean you know i would say most people of sound body and mind would say it's unfortunate what russia's trying to do um america is really in a position to kind of unite the rest of the world around this common cause if russia is able to fully take over ukraine that's that's bad news bears for the entire globe uh, but but t- talk to me a little bit more about about you know, the work you guys are doing to kind of keep that conversation going and, and what, you know, what uh, research are you guys contributing to kind of help um, help the Ukrainians? So the American Enterprise Institute has for a long time had scholars and researchers and thinkers who believe that the United States, for lots of reasons, um, is a good leader of the world. We believe that we can be a, a, a influence and force uh, to help uh, people that struggle, to help advance freedom, to advance independence, to protect small countries from being bullied by large countries, and to protect the free exchange of goods and services around the world. So we 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 take our responsibility as this great country um, to help the world seriously. And we think when we don't get involved in problems around the world, those problems get worse. And then our involvement has to become much more significant and our own security becomes at risk. So as we see what's happened in Ukraine, we see a bully country, a totalitarian authoritarian country, a country that doesn't respect people's freedom, doesn't have a democracy, 
um, invading an independent country that was striving for freedom and, and independence and had achieved it. And um, that upsets the peace of the world. And, and we feel that, that we should respond in a way that is helpful. Now, we have so, so we have supported the bipartisan, lots of Republicans, lots of Democrats, a Democratic president, a Republican head of the uh, Senate, Republican head of the, of the, of the House, investment of, of military uh, might and, and financial support to help Ukraine defend itself against Russia. And it's been very effective. I mean, no one predicted that Ukraine would have done as well as it's done in this fight against a much mm-hmm. larger country that was su- supposedly, you know, almost a superpower. And partly that's because they're fighting for what's right. Their soldiers are motivated. Their soldiers care about what they're doing. The Russian soldiers are um, lost and and unhappy and rebelling and not fighting. And so, um, you know, we just think it's 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 a worthy cause to protect the peace in the world. If we, I took a, a delegation of scholars and and um, and friends of ours over to Poland. If you talk to the Poles or the Germans or the Swedes or the Finland fin, Finns, they believe that if Russia is allowed to do this, they will do it to them. And we need to prevent that to the extent that we can. Now, the line appears to be that we'll help in every way we can, but we won't use American soldiers. Americans are reluctant to um, uh, shed blood in conflicts around the world. That seems like a a burden too much, a a price too high to pay to help somebody else. We want Ukraine to defend Ukraine with our help, and that's what's happening. Um, It happens that I have a son who is stationed in Germany as second lieutenant and is training Ukrainian soldiers in certain certain techniques. And I think that's um, appropriate and acceptable. Um, we've rallied the United Kingdom. We've rallied France. We've rallied Germany. So this is a worldwide effort to prevent Russia from doing this. Um, but it's a fight, and it's sad. And, but the blame is with the Russians. The blame is with Putin. And um, we, hmm. we shouldn't let him get away with it. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. And I want to, I want to talk to you for a moment about neoliberalism. <laughs> and the reason I'm bringing this up, right, is because I'm in a doctoral uh, program. It's a, it's a doctorate of ministry. And I had a class where we had to read uh, several different kind of political theology books. And they were very critical of neoliberalism. And as a Christian and as a conservative Christian, I was taken back, not necessarily a bad way. I was just surprised to read it because I, I, I haven't had a lot of interaction with that kind of literature. I'm sh- I know there's a lot of it, but I, I'm thinking about neoliberalism. And one of the one of the crit- uh, critiques of it is that um, its policies prioritize market efficiency. And um, they can like anything can be monetized. And market efficiency is more important than social equity. Um, and they say it leads to disparities. What would you say to that? How, how do you feel like, what do you think about neoliberalism? Has it been given a bad rap? Maybe even, maybe even you know, uh, just give a brief summary of what it is. Um, and then how is it, how, how can you, like, w- w- what is AI stance and and on so this will, and will this is very much an internal conservative battle uh and so this is, <laughs> well, this is, at, at first i was josh wondering if josh is trying josh to get is answers referring from to the rise of the national conservatives and the sort of authoritarian conservatives on the right who are are who are upset that mar- free market policies and what they call neoliberalism um has not um delivered um, the heavenly city, shall we say, has not delivered the nirvana that they expected. Right. Um, because there is a lot of, there is a lot that markets don't do for, for people. It, we don't provide faith. We don't provide a path to a, that kind of greater good uh, sensibility. Um, uh, we do other things in markets. We allow great freedom. We generate income. We give people opportunity. We think we raise standards of living, uh, but there it's not everything. There's a famous conservative line, I give two cheers to free markets. Um, 
So this attack on neoliberalism <laughs> is really about that. It's saying that, you know, you freedom people, it, 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 it's led to less religion, less faith, less, less belief in America. Um, my view is there's some truth to that, but the answer is not um, a bigger state or a stronger state. Right. Uh, the right. answer is better churches, uh, churches that right. bring people into their parishes, not uh, drive them away. It's a little <laughs> hard for me as a Catholic, a practicing Catholic, to blame neoliberalism on the fact that the number of parishioners in my parish has gone down. That's I, I don't see how right. that works. I, I just it seems to me um, that we ought to heal our own internal self through those parts of American society, not looking to the government. And if you listen to this critique, Josh, that you're reading of neoliberalism, yeah. it can get to a point where it's saying there ought to be a state religion. You know, in the United States, mm. we never had a state religion. I don't think we want a state religion. No but way. The, these critiques of neoliberalism, they or there ought to be certain government policies that prevent certain kinds of um, activity or behavior that offends people's faith-based principles. I mean, it, right. it, it to me that's more dangerous than, and I acknowledge, yes. than the inadequacies of, of free market policies that do lead to a a belief in money over everything else, and a focus on you know economic competition and not spiritual gain. I'm I'm with them on the critique of free markets. Where I'm sure. not with them is on the solution, which is, in my opinion, uh, yes. too too authoritarian for what Americans could ever accept. Absolutely. Yeah, you know that. That's it. I'm curious how do you, how do you reconcile you know this um distaste to kind of have a state religion with a lot of different states um you know pushing very you know judeo christian type of stuff both in the schools and and kind of in the public sector and and and, and i i should say like i you know that this is another i don't know um demerit against me being a liberal i am a believer i actually attend josh's church yeah. Um, and so, so like it, right. it's an area, it's an area that's very important to me. Cause I'm just like, I, 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 I hate to kind of see the faith that I belong to, you know, be, I don't know, like be portrayed in, in sort of this author, mm. authoritarian or theocratic light. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to be clear. Um, you know, some of the conflicts that are happening in schools, for instance, about curriculum, I had four children. My wife was the president of the school board. There are aspects of the curriculum that are insufficiently uh, balanced in their presentation, and they they tend to tilt left. Um, they don't. They talk about the problems in America, but they don't talk enough about the benefits of being being America. Um, they 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 miss out on the uh, often don't depict how church and faith has been a positive force in American life. So I do support, I, I have no problem with parents and others saying, hey, wait a minute, let's have a curriculum that celebrates all aspects of American life, including faith-based organizations or patriotism, and not just a, a, a curriculum that that's, tells kids that America is irredeemably racist, for instance. So I have supported that. Um, what I get a little uncomfortable for, with is is policies that that want to impose a particular religious view on on the way in which we behave, and I, I think that's a little too much. Um, but I do I do I don't I, when it gets into these you mentioned schools and parents and curriculums, and I did want to make sure I, I I said that there was a there is a point there. I'm trying to think. I do have to say when I get into these conversations with people about uh, who come from this sort of new right aspects, these anti yeah. neoliberals, they have the critique down, but they don't have the solution. And the solution sounds to me worse than the problem. And so mm. that's only really what I would say is I don't know. I'm trying to think of 
I mean, for instance, I, I guess sometimes it comes out where on the court, for instance, and, and Josh, I don't know what your view on this. The court has allowed us to decide the abortion question on a state by state basis. They've said the Constitution right. does not say one way or the other. It says, let this be decided by the states. For me, that was a satisfactory conclusion. I did think that Roe v. Wade yeah, took here. that issue away from the democratic process. But some of the critiques of neoliberalism, the critics of neoliberalism and the people on the new right, they don't they didn't want just a ability to decide that on the state by state basis or even democratically. They wanted the court to say this is the law for everybody and we're not yeah. going to let people decide or democracy decide. Yeah. We're going to decide it for everybody. And that, in my opinion, would have been just as bad as deciding it for everybody the other way. And so that's that's an example of the conversation that goes on. I, I, I like that. So, I mean, I'm thinking about right now the things that I have to face day in, day out as a pastor, mm-hmm. um, the issues that people have. That I'm not looking forward to this next election year. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to the vitriol. I'm not looking forward to the division. I'm not looking forward to the potential arguments. I'm not looking forward to that. All that, all that being said, as a conservative and as a and, – and, as a group of conservatives, thinking about it as a whole, putting it as a category, especially thinking about the LGBTQ issues right now that we're facing as a society, and especially in churches, and especially like as new generations are coming up, the difference in opinion, at least from some of the studies and data I've seen on those kinds of issues, what do you think conservatives need to do moving forward in in having a compassionate stance and yet defending things like maybe a traditional view of marriage or things that like the family and and and, and strengthening the family what in general kind of where are the scholars at AEI and even your own and your own thoughts on it where have they fallen along these lines and even helping us conservatives on this side figure out how to navigate these these uh, shark-infested waters? So on marriage, our scholars are filled with rhetoric about the facts that marriage benefits the partners and it benefits children and it benefits society. There's just so much evidence that uh, the institution of marriage is enormously beneficial to communities and to people and to children. And so we're unabashed about that. We're not afraid. People that go to college and get a degree and have high incomes, they're much more likely to get married. And we think we should pra- preach what we practice. We shouldn't be afraid to say, this is work for us. It will work for all of us. And we should be honest about that. That doesn't, And we should have policies in the government that, that don't discourage marriage. We should have tax policies that disadvantage somebody that gets married economically. That doesn't, but we shouldn't have, I don't think we should have marriage requirements or things like that for various things, but we should definitely not have policies that make it economically harder to form a family than it is to stay single and apart. So that's one that we're willing to talk about in terms of outcomes for children. Um, on issues concerning um, um, gender and, and um, um, sexual preference, uh, my own view is the least the government is involved in it, the better. Um, but I would say that that we at AI, there are some scholars that are that are not afraid to say a couple things. One, we shouldn't allow people to capitalize on the normal confusion of childhood. Children, you were a child once. I was a child once. My children. It's, it's you're not always you don't always see the world exactly right. You, you're you're learning. You're confused, and I think that confusion is natural and it's acceptable. And I think in some of these dialogues about what's happening with kids is when they show confusion, adults rush in and say, "Well, th- then maybe you want to be a maybe you're a girl and you want to be a boy." And I think we should stand back and let the child develop naturally and tolerate the normal tensions and confusions that happen with children and not do more harm than good in trying to address that. And on for some people, a big issue in America right now is 
um, biological boys or men participating in women's sports. My own view is that's a matter of fairness. Boys and girls are different. Men and women are different biologically. Women's sports um, is is a different game than than men's sports. And when you allow men to participate in women's sports, you're you're allowing an, a person who has a big advantage over their fellow competitors, and it, it upsets the fairness. And my own view is, and I've got scholars that say this, because we shouldn't we shouldn't upset the fairness of sports in high school or college by allowing men to compete in women's sports. So those are some ideas that we say. We're, we don't, people can do what they want, but we ought to have certain rules or guidelines about the way we approach these issues. Um, so uh, if that gives you a sense of what AI scholars say, I, we don't have an institutional position, uh, uh, but sure. giving you a sense of what our scholars say. Yeah, like how do you, um, with all the scholars you have there, how do you, how do you herd the cats with all the different like <laughs> Very you know, hard. collaboration and all the interdisciplinary research? I mean, like how so do you we love collaboration and we love interaction and we love sharing of data and we love the debate. That's what we really love. When I wake up in the morning and I've got two scholars who are published on the same topic and they're taking different positions, I celebrate. So we like that. It doesn't really bother us. We don't. If I try to herd the cats, I'd be fired. We're not a um, other think tank presidents, the cat. <laughs> um, we don't do that. We like the cacophony and the freedom and the competition of ideas. That's what America is, is great because of. And we try to replicate that here at AI. So I don't I don't try to hurt the cats. You know, I'm it's so interesting, even just I, I, I want to return to the previous question um, that I had asked just because I had had a thought and then I knew Will was asking a question. So I was going to let him and wait and then, <laughs> but what is, so, you know, this idea, I've heard it several times. Why is the government even interested in marriage? Just, I had a gr- really close, a really close loved one say when this was back in like 2016 or be, even before 2015 with Obergefell and he's like, hey, just who cares? Just, just push it to like no government. They shouldn't have any involvement in marriage. What do you think about that? Do you feel like the government should have involvement with marriage? Should the government have a place in defining marriage? Is that the government's job? Well, I have to say, as somebody who worked for a government in New York City under Meyer Bloomberg, a middle of the road, maybe even a, a, a liberal, um, we were we were not afraid to encourage marriage and to put posters up that gave you that statistic right. you mentioned earlier uh, about the chances of avoiding poverty and how marriage played a role in that. Um, we don't think we should have policies that discourage marriage because people are worse off economically through tax or benefit policies by being married. But I don't think you can do much more than those two. You can encourage and promote and tell the data about, but you can't mandate marriage. Um, You know, I think, um, and that's, you know, and my own personal view of the, of the, um, of the gay marriage debate is that um, for someone who spent a lot of time trying to promote marriage among families of men and women, for the benefit of their children, the idea that this this group of other Americans who were saying marriage is great, we should support it, that added that helped my argument. I I, I embraced that thought because they were right. Um, so I, you know um, the 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 my own, again it's a constitutional issue. Should that be right. decided by state legislators? Maybe the court took that out of the state legislatures. They ruled that uh, gay marriage um, uh, should be permitted uh, is a right. So at least that's how I see it. So I, you know, I, I think you, you can say some things and to walk away from it entirely would be a mistake because it has a societal benefit, but you have to be careful about mandating people's personal behavior in a way that's inconsistent with freedom. Mm. Um, so this is our, our last question. Um, and I'm, I'm looking for you to, um, maybe give us a hopeful message 
<laughs> oh, I mean, you love America. I love America. Josh loves America. You know, we've got our warts, but it's it's our country, right? So it's like we 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 love it only the way an American can. So, um, you know, currently we have, um, you know, a president, a president's son, and a former president all being investigated by a special counsel. You know, we have a former president with number of indictments. Um, like, like, like what, what's happening to our country and what, what I'm really glad, Will, you asked that question. Um, I'm very hopeful about America, mainly because of my knowledge of American history. We are a divided country. We've always had divisions. We've always had, and sometimes those divisions have been violent and unpleasant. 1932, 1968, um, 1863. These were very violent and divided and difficult times. Our system of government, our constitution, our commitment to um, a self-government through um, a legislative and a judicial and and an executive branch and federalism, our states, has allowed us to navigate these differences, not in a perfect way, not without trial and tribulation, but in a way that's led us to continue to be the greatest country in the world. And I think that will happen again. Um, We've had bad choices for president before. We've had generational shifts where, you know, there's a great desire for a new and fresh leader that can bring us together. That's happened many times in American history. Um, And it will happen again. I don't happen to think it's going to happen with either of these two gentlemen that are the leading candidates right now. But never fear, it will happen and it will come. But it will, but it will happen because we'll keep talking about it. We'll keep trying, and our democracy will find a way. Um, so I, I, I'm equally discouraged about the divisions and the, the loud voices of the extremes of both sides and the, the two leading candidates. I get that, but it's not over yet, and there's time in this particular election to find somebody with a, a fresher approach, and uh, in either party or both parties, and. Um, I think our scholars' work and your broadcasts and your discussions and your interactions with people will lead people to to want that and to make that choice. Um, but the main thing to have confidence in, frankly, is is our constitutional system. It is a it's ama- amazingly uh, resilient, and it's because it's got this intricate interplay between three branches and the federal and state relationship that allows for it to bend and move and, and adjust and over time uh, find resolution that keeps us together. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's right. And that's exactly, I think, what our country needs and needs to hear. So um, I guess on that note, yeah, thank you so much, Robert. This was a, a great conversation and we really loved having you. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks, Will and Josh. I've enjoyed this immensely. Have me back. <laughs> we'll do it. Absolutely. Uh, We'd love to. To our listeners and watchers, we will uh, see you next week. Take care.